Broadcasting from Charlotte, North Carolina on Sports Byline USA. Uniting sports fans everywhere, this is Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. I'm not sure that God really cares about my comfort or my happiness so much as he does my holiness and my surrender to him. For the next hour, we will unpack sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. I've always asked God to use me as an instrument in any way possible if I can help improve the lives of other people. Bringing you high energy and thought-provoking sports talk with a purpose. When you're around somebody that has that joy and you can feel it and it's contagious. Now, from his mic to your ears, this is Bryce Johnson. Welcome to Unpacking It where we unpack sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. I'm Bryce Johnson, thrilled to be with you today. We have got a loaded show coming up. We'll be joined by three different guests. First, we'll bring on NFL draft prospect Garrett Bradbury. He's one of the top offensive linemen entering the draft, and he played his college football at NC State. And so we'll get his thoughts on the the entire process and and preparation that's taking place right now uh, in order to gear up for the draft. And then we'll also be joined by former UNC basketball star Al Wood. And we'll get his thoughts on his life and and his time at UNC. And it should be a lot of fun to talk with him. And then also, a little bit later... We'll bring on a guest that we love having on. He's always writing a new book, and his latest book is called Character Carved in Stone. He's Pat Williams. He's a basketball Hall of Famer, longtime sports executive, and and he always has great things to share. We'll wrap up the show like we always do with Unpack This, and this week's topic is about brackets and the concept of I told you so. And so we'll have some fun with that in just a little bit. You can check out our website, unpackingit.com. Always love to hear from you. You can email me, Bryce, at unpackingit.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search Unpacking It. Thanks to everybody joining us today on Sports Byline USA, radio stations across the country, and those listening on Sirius XM. Channel 211. We're just getting going. Garrett Bradbury joins us next. Inspiring conversations and intriguing interviews. More Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson after this. Bringing you unique insight into the faith and character of guests from the sports world. Welcome back to Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. Thanks so much for joining us on Unpacking It. I'm Bryce Johnson. Check out our website, unpackingit.com. The NFL Draft is coming up next month, and we are going to talk all about it with our next guest who's preparing for it. And joining us now is Garrett Bradbury, an NFL Draft prospect from NC State. He was honored as the nation's most outstanding center last year as he won the Remington Trophy and is one of the top linemen in this year's draft class. He played his high school football at Charlotte Christian, where he was a tight end, and he joins us right now on Unpacking It. Garrett, thanks so much for being with us. How are you? Doing good, Bryce. Appreciate you having me. Oh, man, absolutely. So this is, a, uh, am sure, a very exciting and, and wild time in your life. And so what has the draft process been like for you so far? Uh, it's been busy. I mean, it's, they call it a four-month uh, job interview for a reason. Cause there's, <laughs> I mean, it's truly it's drawn out. It's a four, it truly is a four-month process. Um, and there's a bunch of steps along the way. I went, went out to Phoenix, Arizona to, to train and, and had a, a senior bowl down in Mobile uh, in January and then back to Phoenix to train and then uh, the combine in Indianapolis. And now I got pro day to look forward to. So a bunch of different steps in the process and, you just gotta show these scouts and these teams kind of who you are as a player and a person. So yeah. So so what was the the draft combine like specifically? What was it? What you anticipated, or or was it a little different? It was awesome. It was 
I mean, there's the most important part of the, the combine is the medical aspect and the interview aspect. And so those went really well. And then other than that, it's just awesome being around some of the top prospects in this year's draft, some of the top coaches and NFL personnel in the league. You're just in in the meetings, you get to you get to hear from a lot of important coaches and GMs and just kind of talk ball with them. So, I, I mean, I loved it doing that stuff. I went out to Phoenix and trained for, for two months for it. So, I mean, yeah. you hope that you're – your preparation and it kind of pays off. So you just go in there with confidence and you're ready to perform. So, I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable experience and I was truly blessed to have been able to be a part of it. Yeah. We're talking with Garrett Bradbury here on unpacking it. And so you're, you're doing all these, these interviews and, and they're, they're asking you questions like what, what is your experience even from the past in, have you been like, have you been interviewed over the years for, I don't know, summer jobs or whatever, or, or was that kind of a, a whole new experience for you to, to kind of face different questions whether football or or even personal related yeah i mean it's super different because um you're kind of taught throughout your your sports career that humility goes a long way and and kind of give all the credit to your team and stuff like that and then then when you're putting these interviews you're kind of supposed to kind of brag about yourself a little bit which is just it was kind of different you want to look confident but not cocky and it was really good you went through some some like interview training throughout the process which helped and the important, the greatest piece of advice that I heard was don't tell them what you think they want to hear. Tell them just kind of who you are. Just talk with them. They just want to see who you are. So hmm. it was really good. Uh, of course, a, a big part of your kind of football story is the fact that, that in high school you played tight end and then at NC State you end up moving to, to play in center. So so take me into what that transition was like and, and, and how thankful you are that that is the, the direction that, that you went on the football field. Yeah, so came in as a tight end and redshirted and had shoulder surgery. So that was kind of a crazy redshirt year. And then moved to D-line for about eight months from uh, January to August because um, there was a need there. And then day one of that fall camp, I got moved. I got called into coach's office, and he was like, listen, I'm not – I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, um, we're going to move you to O-line. It's not, I mean, no one grows up wanting to be an offensive lineman, but <laughs> when he sat me down and told me that I was going to be getting every rep, which is what I was used to in high school. I mean, I didn't come off the field in high school. That's what I love. I was all aboard. Looking back, it's the be- easily the best decision that anyone's ever made for me. No, it, absolutely. And and so last year you were you were named the, the top center uh, in college football, which is a, a huge honor. And what is your approach to goals? And, and even now at this stage, as you gear up for, for the NFL, what role do, do goals play in your life? You know, I think, I think they're huge. I think they're everything. It's something that we do. I'm, I'm not sitting there setting goals in August. We did it in January. That was a big thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And so the idea is you need to have something you're working to, but a big thing we talked about as a program is being process oriented versus results driven. Mm. I'm not sitting there day to day thinking about, listen, I want to be, I'm not in game two saying I want to win the Remington trophy (laughs) game two. um, I'm focused on, all right, if we have practice today, let's be as good as we can at practice. If I have meetings, let's lock in on film review. A great thing that my coach helped me with was setting those goals, but then going about your business day to day. And focus. I mean, it's, it's talked about so much now, but it's true. And focus on the process. And and if you handle your day to day things, you will reach those goals. What you're not going to do is win win these awards and be all conference in week three or week four. So instead of worrying about that, just going in and and attacking the day, attacking the week. Yeah, that's great advice. Garrett Bradbury, our guest right now on Unpacking It. He's an NFL draft prospect from NC State, and so. As you look back at your your college career and and craziness on the football field to go from tight end to defense to to center and and now to to be an NFL draft prospect, what was it like off the field? How, how much did you grow personally and from a a faith perspective? In what ways did your your faith grow in college and 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 how was it challenged? You know, it's challenged those probably in the beginning years when. Like I said, you're on your own and um, going to a Christian school and, and, and you're in church every Sunday. And then you go to college and you don't have to do anything if you don't want. Mm. Um, and so you just get comfortable with, with you know what, I'm just going to sleep in or we don't get that much sleep because of football and I don't need to go to church. And I, I think what really helps is, I mean, it's, it's preached all the time, is surrounding yourself with the right people. Mm. And so that started to change the, the older I got 
surrounding myself with more people that had similar faith and um, guys like hold you, hold you accountable. Listen, we need to go do this. We had an awesome um, chaplain, team chaplain. So going going to his devotions on Sundays and if, if you're if you're with really good friends that that are doing that as well, they'll hold you accountable. You'll hold them accountable. Yeah, absolutely. So along those lines too, was there? I don't know some some aspects of uh, of your understanding of, of who God is and and His role in your life. Some some things that that stand out that 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 He really taught you and and that you you know are really a part of your foundation even as you head into the NFL and and knowing that there will be new challenges and it's a new phase of life. Uh, just some of the, the I guess the the principles that that you really want to to stick to. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things I'm still I'm still working at and still trying to grow with is the fact that this is not um, it's not a checklist. Your religion, your faith is not a checklist that you're just trying. All right, did I pray? Did I do this? Versus, it's a relationship, which is something that you just got to work at, continue to work at, stay consistent with. Like very similar to to what I was saying with your goals in football, you got to have certain goals with with that relationship. And so you just got to stay consistent and committed to that. That's important. It is about a relationship with Jesus for sure. And, and Garrett Bradbury, our guest right now on Unpacking It, he's an NFL draft prospect from NC State. And, and so as you, uh, you know you're about a month away from the, the draft, how are you doing with the anticipation of draft day? What, what, what's your, your mindset like and, and what are some of the emotions that you're wrestling with? I'm I'm doing good. I uh, kind of similar to what I was talking about trusting the process. I just I really am just taking it one day at a time. I'm not gonna be. I can't be drafted tomorrow. I can't be drafted next week. So there's not really a huge point in worrying about it. I mean, it's fun to speculate. It's fun to get antsy and just want to go play. But we, we say be where your feet are um, and mm-hmm. just focus on that. And so I'm just trying to be where my feet are. I have an awesome opportunity where I'm in Raleigh. I get to just work out all day long and um, hang out with some good friends and it's going to, the draft will come and hopefully I hear my name called, but I'm not stressing over it too much. So you're still a month away, but do you have plans for draft day? What, what are you thinking in, in that regard? Uh, you know, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I definitely want to be around the people that help me get where I am. Friends, family, coaches, maybe go to Nashville. Not sure yet. Um, that's an invite only thing, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Haven't made any plans yet, but definitely looking forward to it. Gotcha. Well, very cool. Well, well, I'm excited for you and, and, and we'll be waiting to hear your name called and excited to see uh, where you end up and, and really appreciate you uh, joining us here on unpacking it and sharing some of the, the, the journey with us. And it, it's a, a fun time for you. So hopefully you're able to, uh, to soak it in and, and like you say, enjoy the process. So, uh, so really appreciate it, Garrett. Absolutely, Bryce. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll catch up with him again soon. He's Garrett Bradbury joining us here on Unpacking It. Intriguing guests and inspiring conversations. This is Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. This is Unpacking It. I'm Bryce Johnson. You can shoot me an email, Bryce at unpackingit.com, and let me know what you think about the show. Our next guest is a college basketball legend, and we're watching March Madness right now, enjoying all the games, enjoying all the the young players and and the, the players in today's game, but we can't forget about the legends. And joining us now is a former basketball star from UNC. Al Wood. He set scoring records in the ACC and NCAA. He made the 1980 U.S. Men's Olympic basketball team and became the fourth player picked in the first round of the 1981 NBA draft. He spent six seasons in the league. Since then, he has been a speaker and a minister, encouraging and inspiring young people specifically. His website is yesyoucaninc.com. Al, thanks so much for joining us here on Unpacking It. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Great time of the year, and it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, absolutely. So, so of course, it, it's March Madness, and, and so h- how much do you still enjoy the game, watching the, this generation of, of basketball, and, and, and how excited are you for this time of year? Oh, I, I watch a lot of college basketball. I watch a lot of pro basketball as well, but I really get into the college basketball game. I, I'm real good friends with Roy Williams. 
Roy uh, came to the University of North Carolina at the same time that I did in 1977-78. So we've been friends for a long time. So I keep up with all of his teams, even when he was in Kansas. Very cool. Al Wood, our guest right now on Unpacking It. And, and so you chose to, to play your college basketball at, at UNC and, and even looking at how much you grew from your freshman year to senior year. What was that personal experience like for you? Well, just the opportunity to play for the great Dean Smith uh, was just amazing in itself. Uh, also, I got a chance to play one year with Phil Ford, who I consider still, you know, probably one of the top three-point guards to ever play in uh, the ACC for sure. Mm. And uh, I had to play with some other great guys, Michael Korn, Dudley Bradley, James Worthy, Matt Doherty, and uh, Sam Perkins, and so Jimmy Black as well. So, I had the opportunity to play with some real outstanding players, and that's what you need in order to be successful. We had four great years. You didn't have as many teams getting a bid to the NCAA, so it was very, very important that you played well during the regular season because you didn't know if you were going to get in or not. Mm. So we was fortunate. Our first three years, we got beat in the first round. So my senior year, we made it all the way to the championship game. So uh, that's something that I remember and cherish for the rest of my life. I'm sure you get asked about Dean Smith all the time and, and the impact that he's he's had on your, your life, but but what was maybe the, 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 the one key aspect to your relationship with him that, that, that carries on the most? Well, for me, uh, personally, he recruited all different type of guys. I mean, he recruited guys who was from, you know, an affluent household uh, family. Uh, he recruited guys who had single parents. I mean, he recruited black guys, white guys. He recruited you know, pretty much everybody. Mm. But the thing that has to happen is once everybody get together, everybody wasn't raised uh, the same. They was raised differently. So everybody have to buy into this idea that uh, he has a plan for us to be successful. So everyone has to buy into that plan because if everybody don't buy into that plan, then it won't work. Uh, that, that's a great perspective. Al Wood, our guest right now, former UNC basketball star, uh, with us here on Unpacking It. And uh, what an awesome time of year. And, and great to, to talk college basketball with, with a legend and, and Al Wood. And, and, and Al, even going beyond uh, basketball, let, let, let's talk a little bit just about your life and, and, and the, the personal side of things as well. And, and so you're a, you're a speaker and, and have been for a while with, with a real heart to reach young people, especially regarding the, the dangers of underage drinking and bullying and, and the importance of, of having a plan for, for their future. So, so where does that, that passion stem from for you? Well, it, it extends from uh, my upbringing, really. Uh, I, I came from a, I guess what you would call a early on a dysfunctional family. And mm-hmm. I say early on because eventually – I got adopted, and I moved in with my grandmother and my auntie. Uh, Adele Gray was my auntie. Annabelle Finney was my grandmother. And they gave us a very stable uh, household. Mm. And and to come up in that household, you know, I learned a lot of things. And, but still, there was no male in the household. Mm. And anytime you have a household where there's no male as a, uh, you know, father figure, something is missing because the mother, the grandmother can do all that she, they possibly can do. But it's something that God put within a man to be in the household that it can't be replaced. Mm. And so I, I didn't come up with that. So I, I, I sort of clinged on to certain people in the neighborhood or in the community that I looked up to as mentors as far as males go. And I had a mother that uh, really struggled with the addiction. Mm. And uh, so that was very, very diff- difficult for all of us. I had three brothers and one sister. And as my mother struggled with addiction, Uh, I didn't realize that potentially I could struggle with the same thing at that time because I was so focused into basketball and doing without doing my thing that the last thing on my mind that that was a possibility that that I could become an alcoholic as well. Mm. So so you end up uh, struggling with it and becoming a a major issue in your life. At at what point did your your faith enter the, the, the conversation and and then what role did did God play in your life to really heal you and, and help you overcome your addiction? It was a situation where I was out of basketball. And once I got out of basketball, I had a lot of time on my hand. Mm. And having all that time on my hand and just really being somewhat depressed because I left basketball way earlier 
than I ever imagined mm. that I would be out of the NBA. Mm. So now I'm out of the NBA, and I have a lot of time on my hands. So I began to uh, drink, you know, in my own way, was fighting my own demons, and eventually got to the point where we don't have time to get into it today, but a lot of different things occur, a lot of different things happen in, in my life. I had gotten married, had two kids, and I got to the point when I looked in the mirror, I didn't like the person that I was looking at. So as, as that happened, you know, I made some phone calls, spoke to a guy by the name of John Lotz, who was an assistant athletic director at the University of North Carolina. Hmm. And John was the person that really helped me, besides Coach Smith, to get me on the right path. And at that point, I, I began to have to get some clarity, get some understanding, and uh, just made a rededication of my life to the Lord, which is a sign of strength, not weakness. Hmm. That's what that really is, a sign of strength. And uh, admitted that I had a problem. And once I did that, I, I got on the road to recovery in 1989. And by the grace of God, I've been on that road to recovery until this very day. Amen. Oh, I love it. Al Wood, our guest right now on Unpacking It. And and, and so cool and encouraging to, to just to hear the, the recovery process. And so he, here you are the, the last couple of decades, you know, being open about your your story and, and, and wanting to, to help others. And, and I'm curious, too, just what are your thoughts on today's culture and, and kind of the view of alcohol and drinking and, and just the, the whole culture that surrounds it and how important it is to, to really speak to, to young children to understand before they're even exposed to it and, and kind of go into it full, full throttle. So, so what's, what's just kind of your, your overall perspective on all of that? Well, for the young people today, it is very difficult. So make no mistake about it. I don't speak in terms of you shouldn't just do this or this is something you just have to say no to. It. It's very difficult for young people today. They they are exposed to so many different things. And I've done a number of things with Joe Gibbs and uh, Game Plan for Life, uh, Ronaldo Wynn, who played football at Notre Dame, and he played also for the Washington Redskins. Oh, yeah. And the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. What we try to do is let young people realize and help young people to know is you need a plan. You have you need a game plan for what you want to do. And does that mean it will pan out the way you envision it? It may or it may not. But nevertheless, if it does not pan out, that's not the end of the world. You can go to game plan number two. But you need to have a plan, and you need to have a plan based on the right information. And that's what we try to do, give you the right information and help you get started on a good game plan that will help you be successful and feel good about yourself later on in life. Absolutely. So important. Al Wood with us here on Unpacking It. And, and kind of a final thought as we, uh, as we wrap things up, what, what has God been teaching you recently? What, what's been on your, your heart most recently, things that you've maybe just been thinking about more often or, or learning and, and growing? Well, the thing that I want to do is we have a, a really uh, – a great program here in, uh, we're doing it in Salisbury, North Carolina, with a guy by the name of Terry Osborne and a guy by the name of Chris Sifford. Uh, they've really uh, been great uh, friends to me, and, and we uh, feel like we have something that's really going to impact not only the state of North Carolina, but the entire United States. And what we really want to do, what the Lord has really been uh, showing me, is that what we're doing in Salisbury is something that really needs to be done nationwide. We need to educate young people and help them realize we're not saying uh, to everybody don't drink. That's not what we're saying. Mm. That's not the story. The story is if you are young and you're underage, you should not drink. Number one, you're not physically ready for it. Mm. You're not mentally ready for it. Your body is not ready for it. You are still developing. And if you make a decision to do that, you're going to hinder your growth. And we want you to be all that you can be. And we want you to be the very best that you can be. We've been through it. We've seen it. We know what's on the other side of the door, and we're trying to help you not make the same mistakes that we made. So important. Well, we'll keep it up. That's a, that's a great message, and, and, and wish you the best in, in getting that going and, and, and even spreading that, that message across the, the country. Absolutely. So uh, people can check out your website, yesyoucaninc.com. He's Al Wood, former basketball star from UNC. Really appreciate you being a part of the show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. He's former UNC basketball player Al Wood joining us here on Unpacking It. When we come back, we're going to talk even more basketball with Pat Williams. We'll talk a little NBA. We'll hear about his new book. He's always encouraging. 
It's next right here on Unpacking It. Going beyond the field, this is Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson on Sports Byline USA. Hey, hey, it's Bryce Johnson, and really appreciate you listening to the Unpacking It radio show each week. But I want to invite you to check out our website, unpackingit.com, so that you can sign up to receive Unpacking It each day in your email. That's right. We send out an encouraging, challenging, inspiring word uh, through email. It's, it's in written form. It's a, a devotional that takes a current sports story, relates it to the Bible. We call it Unpack This. And you can subscribe for free by going to unpackingit.com. It's designed to help you grow in your faith and, and help you understand the Bible better, all with a little sports and some of the cool stories going on in the world of sports. And so we encourage you to check it out. It's for you, and it's about two minutes each weekday in your inbox. Check it out, unpackingit.com, and subscribe to Unpack This. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to our podcast as well. Bringing you unique insight into the faith and character of guests from the sports world. Welcome back to Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. It's Unpacking It. I'm Bryce Johnson. Glad to be with you today. If you've missed any part of the show so far, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. That way you'll never miss a show, and you can always hear all of our, our full-length interviews as well. Just search for Unpacking It anywhere you listen to podcasts, and you can check out our website, unpackingit.com, and you can subscribe there as well. And while you're there, you can also subscribe to our weekday email devotional. We call it Unpack This. In just a little bit, you'll get the radio version, uh, but if you want to get that in your inbox each weekday, be sure to subscribe on unpackingit.com. And joining us now is Pat Williams. He's a basketball Hall of Famer and co-founder and senior vice president of the Orlando Magic. He is a motivational speaker, a cancer survivor, and is the author of over 100 books. He has spent over 50 years in professional baseball and basketball as a player and executive. He is the father of 19 children, including 14 adopted from four nations. Pat Williams returns to Unpacking It to talk about his new book, Character Carved in Stone. The book is about Pat's discovery of the leadership virtues taught at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and Coach K wrote the foreword. Pat, great to have you back. How are you? Uh, thanks, Bryce. I'm doing well and uh, very pleased that we can uh, uh, hook up again. Absolutely. Always excited to, t- to talk about your latest book. Uh, but before that, it's a, it's a wonderful time of year for basketball fans. And so how closely do you follow the NCAA tournament? And then what are, maybe are you most intrigued by in regards to the NBA playoffs coming up soon as well? Well, first of all, Bryce, we follow the, the NCAA tournaments. I mean, extremely closely. Yeah, uh, we're we're glued. But we, you know, our our scouts have seen all these all these teams and players, you know, through the season. So they can do a lot uh, of coverage not just by television, but uh, we're all intrigued with it, and we want to see how these best teams perform. Above all, we want to see how these uh, highly ballyhooed players perform. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we're we're pleased. We're looking forward to it, uh, and we'll be following uh, everything very very closely. Very cool. And then we've got the NBA playoffs coming right after that. What what are you most intrigued by uh, th- this this season with in regards to the playoffs? Well, Bryce, we're most intrigued with whether uh, the Magic can can fight their way into the playoffs. That's right. We're in a very very close race with Miami, and Charlotte is still alive and. Uh, uh, so we've got it. We've got a chance and as we go into the last, uh, well, the last two weeks of the season, a little over two weeks. So we're uh, we've had a good year here in Orlando, and we're uh, hoping we can finish strong and battle our way into the into the playoff picture. That's right. No, it has been a, an impressive year for the Magic for sure. Well. In speaking about the the NCAA tournament, and of course you've been around the NBA for for such a long time, 
What, what do you think is the best case scenario when it comes to the one and done rule and, and the relationship between the NBA and, and college basketball moving forward? Well, Bryce, they're, they, they, they're in good communication. Um, you might recall that David Stern years ago uh, wanted to get uh, NBA scouts out of high school gyms. Mm. And thus, uh, this fact that uh, players couldn't be drafted until they were 19, which meant one year in college. And uh, I, I'm not disappointed with it. We get to see these top players, you know, for a full season in, 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 a, in a major setting. Uh, I like that better than taking a gamble on, on a high school kid. Yep. Um, so uh, I don't have a lot of complaints with it. Yes, it would be better if the <clears throat> college kids at least went another year, uh, two and done. But uh, that all have to, has to be collectively bargained, and I don't know where all that's going to play out. But in the meantime, uh, this is what we've been doing now for quite a number of years, and I think it's probably the best scenario right at this point. Pat Williams, our guest right now on Unpacking It. He's a basketball Hall of Famer, and his latest book is called Character Carved in Stone. And so you were an Army reservist in the 1960s, and you recently visited West Point to, to speak to the cadet athletes about leadership, teamwork, and peak performance. And so I'm curious, what were the main points of your message for them? And then we'll talk about what ended up happening after the trip. Well, I, I spoke to all the athletes in a big setting, male and females and their coaches, and I, I talked about what it takes to be an extreme winner. Hmm. Uh, based on what I have observed over these many years of the uh, top athletes that we most admire. What is it about them? Well, they were fanatics about winning. And that's what I found with all of them, just fanatics about winning. And and everything they did in life was to, the, to an extreme level. Uh, so that was the message that I crafted uh, to share with the, uh, the uh, West Point students and athletes. Yeah, so then, so you you go there to to speak and encourage them, and then you leave with with an idea for your your latest book. So so what ended up happening on that trip that that inspired this book? One of the athletes actually was a a, a gal, a swimmer, hmm. and she gave me a tour of the campus, and we ended up in a little park on the campus <clears throat> called Trophy Point, and I noticed a stone bench. Well. I am sure that every park in America has a bench in it, but as I looked further, uh, there were a, a whole row of benches. There were 12 of them. And I thought, boy, in a little park, 12 benches uh, seems a little over the top. Well, for some reason, Bryce, I decided to take a little more careful look at one of the benches. And I noticed on the end of the bench and, and on the other end of the bench, there was a word carved into the stone. Mm. I checked out all the benches, and there was a different word carved into every bench on both ends. Wow. Uh, the, the words were compassion, and courage, dedication, determination, dignity, discipline, integrity, loyalty, perseverance, responsibility, service, trust. And, uh, and then it occurred to me there has to be a backstory here somehow. How did these benches get here in these words? Well, there was a backstory. Uh, the West Point class of 1934 donated as a class gift these benches on their 50th anniversary of graduation, 1984. And, and this was their class gift, the benches. <clears throat> and the, the class of 34 had come up with these words. And then the more I thought about it, I said, boy, that has a chance. That could be quite a book. <laughs> uh, do a chapter on each one of those words and then try and figure out a West Point product graduate who best modeled that word mm. we, I, I i asked mike shashevsky the duke coach who is a west point graduate oh yeah if he would be kind enough to uh write the forward for us man no that's a great story and and just how it came about pat williams our guest right now here on Unpacking It, talking about his new book, Character Carved in Stone. You're, you're the father of 19 children, including 14 adopted. And and so I, I've got to tell you, my, my wife and I, we're due with our first child. And, and so what's your advice to a, a first-time dad like myself? Uh, listen to your wife. <laughs> yep. pay, pay attention to her needs. 
uh, share in the uh, these early these early years because there's a, a lot of work. Uh, when that baby starts hollering, Bryce, um, uh, don't don't pretend that you're asleep. <laughs> That's good. Uh, he, you, you you get out of bed as as much as she has. For in this immediate period, your wife's going to need a lot of help. Uh, she's going to need a lot of attention. She's going to need a lot of uh, a lot of serving on your part. That's right. Uh, that that's just uh, that's what I've learned. Uh, that that's absolutely the case. As you, as your child gets older, uh, you know, stay involved in their life. Mm. Uh, go to their games. No, I, I appreciate the wisdom, and, and yeah, I'll take that to, to heart for sure. And, and so I, I understand that you're, you're now in, in remission and, and fully recovered from your, your cancer battle. A- any update there? You're, you're still feeling good? Bryce, I was diagnosed uh, over eight years ago now with a cancer called multiple myeloma. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's a blood cancer of the bone marrow. Uh, not, kind of a kind of a rare form of cancer, but uh, a tough one. Well, I've responded well to all the different forms of treatment, all the most uh, recent chemo, and the doctors are pleased with where I am. They don't see any signs of it, and um, I feel good. I, my energy level is good. I'm able to keep my full schedule. Oh, that's great. So uh, that 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 pleases me. So thanks for asking. Many. Many, many people have been praying for me, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that the, the Lord has said, we need to keep that Williams guy around here a little <laughs> bit longer because there's, there's more that he needs to get done. So uh, that, that's how I'm viewing it. Absolutely. You continue to, to be an inspiration and encourager to, to many. And, and so as, as you do look back, though, at, at your cancer battle, what, what did God reveal to you during that time, and, and how did your faith really grow throughout that experience? Well, when that when you're diagnosed, Bryce, at that point you're shocked, you're 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 absolutely devastated. Mm. And after you kind of get <clears throat> your feet under you again, you, you're you're faced with one of two choices. One, you're shaking your fist in God's face, saying, "How could you do this to me? You know, I don't deserve this. Mm. You know, I'm 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 angry with you." I mean, that's one option. The other option is. You just leap in the Lord's lap, just leap in his lap and wrap your arms around his neck and and hang on for dear life. Mm. And and I elected the second option. Uh, that's that's what I did then. I'm still doing it. And uh, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, I've learned uh, about the uh, the enormous sweep of cancer mm. in our country. One, one out of two men... Uh, at some point in their life, will will deal with cancer. Wow! One one out of three women, and and the research is great, and they're 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 doing a lot to uh, get on top of this illness. But you know, it's it's a it's a major issue, and so I um, I've encouraged men particularly do not neglect your yearly physical. Mm. Just don't don't neglect it. I mean, they'll they'll if there's anything going on that shouldn't be going on, they'll spot it. But so many men, Bryce, are, you know, their position is, eh, I don't have time for that. But that's foolish. And I, uh, you know, my my cancer was discovered through my yearly physical. And that's when they spotted it. And, and that's the case in, in most cases. So uh, that, that's the best thing I've learned. And uh, uh, I've, I've learned also to, um, to counsel and help others who are now going through it. I hear from people on a regular basis who have been diagnosed and for some reason they've gotten the book I wrote called The Mission is Remission and they want to to talk, they need somebody to help them and you know that's what I've been doing and uh, so the Lord has called me into this cancer battle. I I, I didn't volunteer for it but uh, that's where he has placed me and I'm right smack in the middle of it even as we speak. Mm. No, that's that's great. I, I love that image that you provided to to jump in the lap of God. We'll end it right there. What what a wonderful message. He's Pat Williams, the the Hall of Famer. His new book is called Character Carved in Stone. Pat Williams, always great to have you on the show. Really appreciate it. Good. Thank you, Bryce. Nice to talk to you. And people could go up to Amazon and order this book, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, so forth. And I hope they enjoy it. I know they will. He's Pat Williams, Basketball Hall of Famer, joining us here on Unpacking It. Up next, we'll do our segment 
unpack this about how we respond when we get the brackets correct. That's right. If you're one of those that actually has a good bracket right now, I've got a word for you. Stick around. More unpacking it right after this. Inspiring conversations and intriguing interviews. More unpacking it with Bryce Johnson after this. This is Unpacking It. I'm Bryce Johnson. It's time for our final segment of the day. We call it Unpack This, where I take a current sports story and relate it to the Bible and our own lives. So let's jump right in. Even though many of our brackets are already busted, filling out a bracket is always fun because we try to find where the upsets might be and predict which teams will reach the final four. Throughout the tournament, we keep an eye on how our bracket is looking and how our guesses are turning out. Very simply, we fill out a bracket in order to be right. We want to pick the correct winners and show off our basketball brilliance by choosing the upsets. It's nice when we actually look at our bracket and see our team still alive in the tournament, but why do we really like to pick the winners? Is it so we can tell our friends and coworkers that we were right? Is it so we can make comments like, I told you they were going to win, or didn't I tell you they were going to pull the upset? Of course, because we love to get things right and prove we're smarter than someone else. It sure beats being wrong. However, the need to be right often infiltrates other areas of our lives and can create major conflict within our relationships. There's nothing more annoying than hearing someone obnoxiously remind you that you were wrong and they were right. But we also want to make sure we're not that guy either. Proverbs reminds us that when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. There's no denying how good it feels to be right. But as we follow Jesus, we must seek humility and leave behind the prideful, I told you so. Proverbs also says, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Standing on truth and upholding our convictions is important, but let's be challenged not to get caught up in arguments that only center around proving how right we are. Today, let's be aware of when our pride is about to take over and instead humbly submit to God to help us back down. So I hope you're willing to unpack that for yourselves and really appreciate you joining me today and hope you'll stay connected with us throughout the week on social media and on unpackingit.com. If you have any thoughts about today's show, you can email me, bryce at unpackingit.com. Until next time, I'm Bryce Johnson. I'm a sports fan who follows Jesus. I believe in the good news that he died on the cross for my sins. He was resurrected and through faith, I have been saved by his grace. I hope that is true for you as well, and I hope you'll join me as we live life as sports fans who follow Jesus together. Have a wonderful week. This has been Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson on Sports Byline USA and Sirius XM, Channel 211, Dan Patrick Radio.